Yeah, bioinformatics meets neuroinformatics. I guess what I want to do today is tell you about some of the work that um, we do uh, in collaboration with a, a, a bunch of groups right across Europe. Uh, and I'll try and remember to, to name them all as I go through. Uh, and apologies if I miss any of them out. Um, where we're actually looking at fairly large scale raw data sets coming from what would typically be analyzed in a kind of bioinformatics approach, but then looking for how do we try to start to link up the levels of, uh, of biological organization. What I mean by that is, um, great, slides don't work. Good start. Ah, there we go. Is predominantly the, the information we get is at the molecular level. But what we actually want to really do is understand things like the brain and behavior and so on. And traditionally, there's just a big jump, the so-called phenotype gap between the genetics and the molecular biology that you do uh, in, in research and ultimately what you're interested in, which is the, the, the behavior of the system. Now, various aspects of this are going to be dealt with on, on the course uh, this week. And you've heard some of, about it, said some of the aspects of brain organization and how to, how to handle brain data uh, this afternoon. Um, but you're also going to hear uh, various parts about modeling uh, neural function uh, and synaptic function uh, from various people. So we're going to focus on how do we start to dig down at this molecular level, which is usually kind of distinct uh, from the rest of the process, and how do you feed that up into models of neural function and synapse biology. <laughs> so no one in here can see anything now. So why is this difficult? I mean, bioinformatics has existed for a while. Um, it can handle raw data sets pretty well. Um, then there's really good, mature, advanced methods for doing this. But actually, what really comes into it is just the complexity of the neuron itself. In terms of the molecular level, we're interested in what's happening at the synapse. Each of these little green dots on this very faint neuron uh, that's been woefully projected on the screen in front of you. Um, each of these green dots contains the molecular complexes that we're actually interested in what, where things are happening in terms of information being processed, chemical signals coming in, <coughs> being translated into ion channel changes. But each one of those is a separate distinct molecular unit. And bioinformatics doesn't really deal with that. It deals with the whole thing as a bag happening in a, in, a, in a general volume. There are exceptions, but in general, it deals with things happening into the cell as a whole. And so the complexity of the neuron is a, is a fundamental challenge to most bioinformatics um, uh, approaches. So we're looking at different ways to, to try and address this. So what we do, or what we're trying to do, what we call systems neurobiology, is where we start with kind of data and bioinformatics. These large scale, high throughput approaches that give us a lot of genetic data, proteomic data, transcriptomic data and so on. And assemble these into get intermediate models that kind of capture what we know about the molecules and how they interact and how they, uh, how they interplay with each other. And so the data integration step in, in producing static models uh, that you see in co common systems biology uh, type approaches. But then to take that slightly further and actually capture some of the logical arrangement of what's going on in there in terms of what are the rules uh, that limit these interactions. So the, the middle stage here gives you a, a map of all the possibilities, but then we can actually start to put the constraints on that and what, can, what interactions uh, can happen at the same time what the competition for these is, how they're regulated, and so on. And then we're looking for this as a way of feeding up uh, towards, towards what would traditionally be called neuroinformatics, or computational neuroscience. So what we work with, with our collaborators, and in particular uh, the groups of Seth Grant and Hus Smith, uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, in various parts of the talk today, is uh, synapse proteo proteomics, where you basically take uh, mashed up uh, animal tissue extract the synapses from it, and then identify what proteins you find in there. And there's a number of different techniques. I'm not going to go into the techniques in detail for these. There's a number of techniques to get a kind of global view of everything that's happening in all synapses, as well as more focused uh, methods that allow you to pull down specific receptor complexes. Uh, so everything from you know, 3,000, 4,000 proteins in a single study down to two or 300 proteins that are, that are uh, inherently linked uh, to a, a specific neurotransmitter receptor or so on. Um, what I'll focus on to begin with is just walk through one of the examples, one of the simpler ones. So we'll take one of the smaller complexes and we'll walk through the sorts of things that we do uh, and what kind of information we can learn from that uh, and then uh, 
stop briefly and go through some of the larger data sets and try and show you what we can learn from that and some of the challenges that the larger data sets show you. So the first complex we analysed, uh, and this is what we did with Andrew Pocklinton here and Seth Grant, uh, is so-called the NRC or the mask complex. Uh, and this is, a this is a complex of 186 proteins uh, closely associated with the NMDA receptor uh, and, and pulled down uh, with affinity purification. So what we did was we, take, we, we start off with a classic bioinformatics approach in terms of identifying what all molecules are in there, so a list of 186, and then just going to say what can we tell you, what can, what can we say about those molecules and can we look for enrichment in specific things. So what we did was we looked for enrichment for key terms in, in terms of what's known about those molecules. So for, for instance, synaptic plasticity, were those molecules already known to be associated with uh, synaptic processes. Behavioural plasticity in terms of if there was a, a mouse knockout or an animal model for those, did it affect any kind of aspect of the animal's behaviour? And then if we translate that molecule to the human ortholog, uh, is there any involvement in psychiatric disorders? Now, when we say involvement in psychiatric disorders, we're not looking at very, very uh, closely defined proven genes linked to diseases. We're looking at just very, very loose associations. So, that, for instance, the gene is overexpressed in post-mortem tissue or so on. So this is fairly loose evidence. But what we see with this complex is it's massively enriched for disease, behaviour and electrophysiology. So just this very simple list analysis actually tells us that we're looking at something that is enriched for a whole pile of interest in proteins and is worth uh, taking further. Um, and we can do the, the stats to show this is not a random uh, subset either. Uh, I'll show you how we do that later. We then want to try and see a bit more about the organisation of it. So that's just a list. And you can do various list analyses. You can, you can look at enrichment for functional types of proteins and so on. I'm not going to go into that. But what we really want to then do is look at how is it, how is it organised? How do these molecules interact with each other? Because fundamentally, that's how they work. That's how, that's how things are going to happen. Uh, in a molecular complex. So what we did for this particular example was we, we started off with uh, the online protein-protein interaction databases. So we, we took the proteins that we got from the, the biological tissue. We did a database searches for protein-protein interactions. We pulled all the papers out that uh, were associated with those protein-protein interactions. We read them. We threw half of them back out because actually they weren't the same genes that they said they were in the paper. We then did uh, an extensive literature search using uh, text mining and so on, and then basically every single interaction in there is something which has been read by at least two biological experts to check that the protein, protein interaction is verified and we can go back to the original sequence. Uh, so each one of those little interactions a few years ago was someone's PhD project. So we put a big thank you to all the people who actually put those little black lines in these diagrams that we normally just ignore. Uh, so I'll take the opportunity just to say that now. Um, but this is the first stage. This actually builds as an interaction network, a potential map of interactions. We're not saying they always happen all that, this way. We also have to admit that a lot of it's going to be missing. You know, for proteins that have never been studied before, nobody's looked for the interactions, so we don't know they exist yet. Uh, I'll come back to some things that we're doing to address that later. But this is the kind of first step in building these, these static interaction network models. When we do this and we kind of spread it out, uh, we can start to see some, some structure emerging. Now, what we've done here is we've, we've done a, a, a fairly simple cluster analysis. So what we've done is we've taken the entire map of all the protein-protein interactions, uh, and then we've split them out into, into clusters of molecules which tend to interact with each other more closely than they do with the other partners in the network. Uh, now, what we actually did for this is we, we tested about eight or nine clustering algorithms, uh, and then printed them out in a bit of paper, and then took them around a bunch of biologists and says, which of these makes sense? And this is the one that, that really stood out. Uh, and this is a, a, an algorithm by Newman and Gervin for community architecture networks, which effectively works by taking a random protein in your, in your network, uh, uh, selecting a protein at random, and then taking a random walk through the network. Every time you go through an edge or a protein-protein interaction, you add one onto the value of that. You do that 100,000 times, you end up with a ranked order of the number of times you've gone through every single protein-protein interaction. You then remove that and start all over again. And effectively, what happens is that the network fragments uh, into, these, the, into these clusters. But when we then take these clusters uh, and then look at where those molecules were that we did in the initial list analysis, remember we've looked up for disease association, molecule type, and so on. What you find is that those clusters then tend to congregate. So we get, for instance, up on the, the, the top, uh, this, this cluster here, 
we're starting, we get a, a, an increase uh, in terms of anotropic, uh, anotropic glutamate receptors, but also for involvement in molecules linked into schizophrenia. Whereas we get metabotrophic glutamate receptors over in this other cluster, closely linked to each other, but more of an association with depressive illness rather than schizophrenic illness. So we're starting to see hints of things we can go back into the lab and test. We wouldn't take this as being ground truth and say, right, fine, we understand everything about schizophrenia or depressive illness now, but at least it gives us some more target molecules to go back and look at. Have some of these molecules ever been looked at in terms of their association with the diseases? So it gives us a, a way of, of informing what we're doing. The other thing that emerges for this is quite an interesting kind of basic architecture. We can see, for instance, the, the two blue clusters are very obviously uh, receptors. Uh, uh, membrane-bound receptors. We also see, and this, is, this has been seen in, in several studies, this is, this is unique to anything we are doing, but this is seen quite often. So you get this kind of input layer, these input clusters, so information coming into the complex. We get a large kind of central complex in red here that's involved in kind of basic processing of that information. And then a series of output pathways, kind of classic output pathways, for instance, the MAP kinase pathway coming out there. We also get things that are involved in, in, in anchoring the whole complex to the cytoskeletal. Uh, system and all the rest of it. So overall, the map makes reasonable amounts of sense. Uh, and we basically, instead of having to try and show you this network model all the way through, uh, when I come back, to, I'll probably just use this little cartoon where we've got the kind of two receptors out on the, the cell membrane, we get a processing cluster and some output ones, just to give you a kind of feel for how we how we do it. So one of the things we, once we had this in, in, in place, we said, well, where did this come from? This, this didn't just appear uh, miraculously. This, this, this came from some uh, evolutionary process from unicellular organisms all the way through to the mammals that we, we actually did the work in. So we, we started off, and this was with Richard Eames, uh, started off by looking, not just actually at this complex, we looked at a slightly larger one as well, but I'm going to focus on the smaller complex again. We started off just by doing a bioinformatics approach. Given our root uh, data came from the mouse proteomics, how many of these can we map very accurately onto 19 other species for which there was a good genome annotated at the time we did this work? Um, and so we took a total of 651 synaptic proteins. The smaller cluster that I've just showed you, plus a larger collection of, of general synapse proteins. And the story that emerges is, 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 quite, is quite interesting. What you find is across the, the mammals and, and, and even just the vertebrates, you actually can pretty much find an awful lot for almost everything that you found in the mouse. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the stuff that's missing, a lot of these slight changes in these graphs there are really just the quality of the annotation of those genome databases at the time. There are exceptions, but almost everything is one-to-one -one orthologs. But if you go back into the invertebrates, there's a big drop. So effectively, uh, if you go to Drosophila, which is the one that was best annotated, it's about 47% uh, of, the f of the proteins that we can find in, uh, in, in the mammal brain that we can also find in the Drosophila genome by bioinformatics approaches. Interestingly, you can even trace 23% of them back to yeast. Uh, so a unicellular organism with no nervous system. So 23% of it is there. Actually, every major class of molecule that we have in the pool down, you can trace at least one ortholog back to yeast. So all the building blocks are, are, are there in a unicellular organism. Uh, now, of course, yeast has gone through just as much evolution as we have. We all come from a common ancestor rather than we're not, yeast isn't the ancient uh, genome. But we, it, it is interesting that everything is, is effectively there. So the, the model that kind of emerged from that, and that's the one we discussed a few years ago, where we have some sort of, sort of primitive stress response that's effectively present in all unicellular organisms through uh, a, 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 an increase in, in genome complexity allows simple learning or cognitive processes at the molecular level. And in the mammals, it's effectively there's a bigger repertoire of molecules you can choose from. Of course, there's one alternative explanation to all this, uh, and that's actually that um, there is 300 million years of evolution between Drosophila and mouse, which are the two things that we'd, we'd studied most closely. And perhaps actually all that happened is there's another 50% missing there that we didn't see in the proteomics in, in, in the mouse that would be there in fly if you went and looked for the same complex in the fly. We'll come back to that in a second. What we also did was we looked at the gene expansion by class of molecules. 
So we split the, the, the genes that we had found into kind of seven or eight broad classes. So the scaffolders, scaffolds, kinases, channels, receptors, and so on. And then we looked at the, the origin of them. Uh, and what we find is that for the kind of clearly synapse-associated ones, uh, so the first ones, you see a small number going back to yeast, but a big expansion in the, in the invertebrate and a big expansion in the vertebrate lineages. So there's a small number of these you can trace to unicellular organisms and then a big jump uh, at the, these major evolutionary boundaries. If we look at the bottom ones, ATP synthesis, heat shock uh, and chaperone proteins and transcription translation things, so actually what we find is most of those we can trace back to single orthologs in yeast and a very small amount of extra additional ones appear to be more recent proteins. So, and actually those also then map spatially onto the to the, to the um, cluster diagram that we've done before. So the recent, or the recent innovations that, are, that appear to be more either invertebrate or vertebrate specific map more likely to the input and the processing areas. These uh, more basic processes are much more likely to be in the output ones. And that's why we see things like the map kinase pathway in there that's conserved across everything we've ever looked at. So back to my other alternative to this. So is is, this, is the brain of this thing here really that much simpler? Is it really 50% simpler? Okay, it's a lot smaller, it doesn't do as much. Uh, or is it just different? Is there just 300 million years of evolution that's actually allowed it to, to bring in other things? So what we actually did was we went back and did exactly the same experiments again. I'm afraid those slides are not um, reproducing very well. Um, so we basically redid the proteomics. Slack connection, maybe? Um. Oh, hey, experiment works. <laughs> if only fixing them in real life was so easy. Um, so we went back and effectively repeated the experiment um, for you know, as closely as, as we could to, the, to, to what we did with the, with, with the mice. So, Unfortunately, four grams of, a, of, of brain tissue in a mammal is a, a little bit difficult to get from a fly brain. Uh, so that equates to roughly 10,000 fly heads. So we had to collect 10,000 fly heads. Uh, but then we did effectively the same uh, pull-down protocols where we actually pulled down the NMDA receptors from those, those animals using a, a hexapeptide affinity purification technique. Uh, and you know, the controls all work, which we get the similar sort of initial key proteins down, like the key scaffolding proteins that we find associated with the mammal synapse, we still get fly. So we're getting something like that. But when we actually look at what we get, first of all, we're pulling heads down, so it's a little bit dirtier in terms of things like uh, you know, some of the kind of very basic uh, a kind of kinases and, and things like that. But if we actually filter these for the synaptic proteins or synaptic related proteins that you get, what we get is effectively this fraction of things which comes into channels, receptors, cell adhesion molecules, G proteins, signaling molecules in general, is roughly 50% of the size that you find in the, in the mammal. So that's the fly fraction there and the mouse fraction there. If we go back and then say, well, where do these proteins come from, we get a very, very similar, similar story. We get the, uh, the cytoskeletal and cell adhesion molecules are largely conserved with yeast, uh, with an expansion in, in flies, with some fly-specific ones coming in, but not many. Uh, but when you go to the very basic things like transcription and translation, you find that most of that is of an ancient origin. There's not particularly anything new. So it's the same story as we're seeing in the mouse. There is just less of these signaling molecules. So most classes, as I said, are already, are already present. There's a large expansion in the invertebrates and in the vertebrates. Uh, and with a larger expansion, expansion in the vertebrate lineage, but that expansion is targeted. Uh, so these upstream signaling and structural molecules, there's more of them have, have cropped, into the, cropped into the vertebrate. So we also had a look at where those are expressed, and this is uh, pre allen Brain Atlas days, so this, we, this had to be uh, done through a variety of uh, techniques. This was led by Chris Anderson and Seth uh, Grant's lab. We did it, he collated various different data sources, some of which they did in-house, some of which they got from collaborators, from Western blot analysis from dissected brain regions, from immunohistochemistry on, on animals, in situ hybridization, uh, and, and microarray data, again, from dissected brain regions. 
Uh, so a variety of quantitative and qualitative uh, data altogether, uh, information on up to 148 proteins. Obviously, you know, obviously the number of immunohistochemistry stains and proteins of a smaller subset of those. Um, and to, to try and summarise this very, very briefly, what they effectively found was that the, if you looked at the yeast, pro, uh, proteins conserved with yeast, so ones from unicellular organisms, you find out that they are very, very uniformly expressed in the mammalian brain. The ones that are metazoan and in other words shared with, with, with invertebrates tend to be kind of medium. There's, there's a variety of ones that are very specific versus ones that are very uniform across the brain. And the vertebrate innovations are the ones that are most likely to be very specific to different brain regions, indicating that that's possibly what's allowed the brain to uh, develop its complexity, or at least the, the increasing complexity in the mammalian brain has inherited in those new innovations. It's one, one explanation, but there's another. There are others. So again, we went back and said, okay, fine, that's, that's kind of an interesting story, but what about flies? Is there a similar thing here, or is this just an artifact of uh, the specifics that we looked at? So we also looked at uh, flies by tagging uh, neural proteins. So what we did was we worked with um, a, a Steve Russell's group in Cambridge where we tagged, or they tagged and we screened, a, a, a random proteins, 400 of, or 500 of these, sorry, were actually expressed in the brain. So we used a, a mobile genetic element, which mini whites is an eye color marker in flies, uh, but it has proteomic markers so we can do affinity purification from these and a GFP marker. And this is designed to actually go into the splice mechanism within proteins. So we've t uh, essentially tap tagged uh, 500 neural proteins. So the, the insertion site was cloned, so we know which ones we've, we've tagged. Uh, we've done Westerns to confirm that the gene model is correct, and we know which, which splice variant of the protein that we've got these tags into. Uh, and then we started looking at the, the brain expression pattern uh, for these. So effectively dissecting and, and doing a 3D reconstruction for each of these. These are also lined onto a, a common reference, so you can actually compare one protein uh, expression pattern against another, and this is just three of them overlaid onto each other uh, and then annotated. And the take-home message for this is exactly, is exactly the same as the mouse. 77% of the scaffold proteins show, those, show regional specificity, that they're in one brain region and not another. 81% uh, of the arthropod variations, this is the invertebrate uh, specific ones, vary. But the transcriptional genes, for instance, show very, very even expression. When it says even expression, and this it means in every single neuron throughout the entire brain. So we've got uniform expression. So we've got a, a kind of model that's emerging from this, uh, where expression variability is greatest in this upstream signaling region and structural proteins, so they're both in this, uh, in this region here in the model, but also in here. Uh, and very, very conserved down here. So the, the signaling complex is recycling and reusing very, very ancient conserved signaling, signaling cascades. Lineage specific innovations, in other words, the ones that are closest to the speciation event are, tend to be the genes that vary the most in their expression patterns. So they're very more, much more likely to be involved in uh, species specific differences. Whether that translates to behavior or any cognitive processes, we don't know yet. That's not been been looked at, but that's just the trend that's emerging from this, but something to be tested. Um, and we've got a common core, I didn't, didn't show the data for that, but there's a common core of neural molecules uh, expressed in homologous brain regions as well. Like for instance, if we look at uh, the proteins that are expressed in, in kind of gustatory control regions in the fly, we find that there's the same ones that are expressed in gustatory uh, control in, in the mammalian brain as well. So it, it's not, that's not particularly significant uh, in terms of the numbers but the trend is, is certainly there in the data. It just shows you what we can do. And the model that was proposed for that was the idea that this, this increased uh, availability of signaling complexes uh, allows greater diversity in terms of brain regions in, in the larger brains. And whether that's how, how, and, and also an increased range of, of uh, cognitive processes, increased power in that. So, that's the sorts of thing we can do in terms of bringing together from a bioinformatics and, and systems biology approach in terms of um, small networks. But obviously we want to go to the larger networks. We know already that that's just one very, very small receptor. How do we scale to the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 that you can find in modern proteomics studies with increased sensitivity and better methods? You can start to find an awful lot more molecules in these studies. 
how do we scale to that? So we spent some time developing some uh, a range of bits of software to, to actually improve this. So this is uh, work that was led by Ian Simpson uh, in the group. So this is, for instance, for getting the protein-protein interactions. You tend to do your pull down in one species, but you want to aggregate evidence from every species where there are protein-protein interactions. I said earlier on that there's very often data missing. You, you need to f go out and look for evidence that two proteins interact. So for this, this piece of software effectively works on the principle that if, for instance, you've got two human proteins and you don't want to know if they're interacting, if, there are, if the two orthologs of these in mice are very, very similar and interact, there's a very high confidence you can say that they will also interact in human. And obviously you can do, a co that confidence becomes less as you go further in terms of evolutionary distance or at least in terms of protein sequence. So this just allows you to go and basically say, I've got, here's my candidate list of proteins, can I find evidence from any species and then rank order that, that evidence uh, by the evolutionary distance. So it allows you to, to get that, that's, that's publicly available. So these various papers we're going to make available anyway uh, for anybody who wants to, to use any of this stuff. The other thing was obviously the clustering algorithm that we, that we, that we chose, that we, the one that actually gave, just gave us the best results, this Newman and Gervin one, uh, is computationally fairly expensive. So that's been uh, re-engineered by Colin uh, McLean in the group. Uh, and again, there's, a, there's some open source code available for that for anybody who wants to try it. Uh, on small networks, it's just fine. Uh, once you get up to 1,000 molecules, it starts to slow down considerably. If you think about the complexity of the random walk on those size of networks, it just gets uh, computationally expensive. The other thing, obviously, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to test how robust the clusters are as well. So, for instance, if you add noise or you remove information, uh, how likely is, for instance, this, this protein here to jump out of that one cluster and into another? Uh, and that's built into these, these systems. And again, there's a, a software package designed as well uh, for actually measuring that confidence. So you can get a, a measure for how confident you are in the, the clustering uh, results. So we put the tools in place to scale this up a little bit. So, um, in terms of videoing stuff, I'm going to show you some, some of the more recent results. What I've showed you so far is the um, kind of publicly available stuff. Uh, so we're going to edit this next bit out. So as I say, what happens in Vegas is going to stay in Vegas. Um, what I want to tell you a little bit about is, about, is, is the kind of next generation of these studies. Uh, and this is what we've been doing with Hoos Smith and a, a number of others at, at, at Amsterdam, where they've taken this kind of model of what they already think is happening at Synapse. This is based on proteomic studies already. There's a good, good wad of molecules on there. You know, it's quite a complicated model. And what they've done is, is, is they've identified what they consider the important molecules. Uh, that's a very, very subjective term, and they'll be the first ones to admit it. So they've identified 50 important molecules, and this is at the presynaptic region rather than the postsynaptic region. Uh, and they're doing immu immunoprecipitation uh, from all of those. So they now have a pipeline set up where they can do synaptosome enrichment, so purify synaptosomes from biological tissue, uh, pro extract the protein complexes, and then do immunoprecipitation to those, to those 50 important molecules. Uh, what they've also done is not just the 50 that's there, is they've done the, the pull-downs from those and then identified, you know what, there's a bunch of other proteins that we get when we pull down with these, so let's go and do the next lot as well. Uh, so actually the number of IPs that we're looking at isn't one or two now, it's now 90 with controls. So we're now looking at one of the largest scale proteomic studies, I think, that's been done in the setup. So that's just some examples of these things uh, in terms of the original raw data where the slices cut up and then those slices then go into the mass spec for, for identification. Uh, and obviously, this involves a large number of people. Um, I wish it was done here, but it, uh, it's uh, largely from Hus Smith and Matthias Bahaji's group. So they deserve all the, the credit for this. So 90 baits so far, so that's 90 sets of antibodies. In fact, sorry, not 90 sets of antibodies, that's 90 sets of proteins that have been pulled down with multiple antibodies. Uh, identified 2,100 uh, partners so far. Um, of which there is a bunch of obvious contaminants, things like bovine serum albumin that's been spiked into the, uh, the, the protocol so we can remove those quite nicely, antibody fragments and so on. Um, and so we cleaned all this up. This turns into about 2,025 proteins that you, you can identify from the uh, presynaptic region. We map those onto stable IDs, so this is what comes out of the mass spec. Um, and we can actually get unique mouse IDs of, for 97% of these and we can map those onto the human orthologs for 94%. So we can get a pretty good uh, 
uh, recall of this. This is, this is what's still in progress. It's, slightly, it's being slightly cleaned over the, uh, in the intervening time since I built this slide. Uh, in terms of what we already know, we, we can, we can th these names won't mean much to you. Build 2 is the antibody list. Um, that's just a, a thing. Mouse PSD is just, is what, how does it overlap with proteins that we already find in postsynaptic density, not presynaptic density, immunoprecipitations. You see it's quite a big substantial amount of overlap. Um, now there's not, we wouldn't necessarily think all those are contaminants without think there is a lot of common proteins. Uh, and when you drill into a lot of the evidence, we can actually find evidence for pre and postsynaptic localization for a lot of these proteins. We obviously haven't looked at 600 lines of evidence for this. We've just taken some, some key examples out of this uh, present. Um, presynaptic is a smaller list, but obviously that was based before we did the, the large scale proteomics. So um, it's just our known list of, of, of uh, presynaptic uh, proteins. Um, it's about 619 proteins which haven't actually been linked into a synapse molecular model so far. So a lot of new stuff to work with. So again, we work with the same sort of, the same sort of processes. How do we, we reconstruct this into um, a model that maybe makes a little bit of sense? So we've got a bunch of protein-protein interaction databases. We've got the homology interlog walk that I mentioned uh, where we look for the evidence from uh, other species. Uh, and human protein interaction databases as well. Collapse all the common lines of evidence over a reasonable confidence threshold. And it basically allows us to make a network out of the original 2,025 cleaned proteins of 1,308. So you can still see there's a lot of stuff we can't connect into these models. So there's a lot of protein-protein uh, interaction data still missing. Uh, but 1,308 worth 8,500 8, interactions. And that's what it looks like. So we now understand the presynaptic uh, signaling complex because we can show it on the, on the screen. Uh, but this is, a, this is basically just the entire map of interactions and it's just done clustered with the same clustering algorithm that I showed you for the other one. So it scales to um, identify the kind of, these, these wheels effectively are more commonly connected together than they are uh, with the, the neighboring partners. So that's all this is particularly showing. So how do these vary? This is one thing that we, we are we thought we could potentially do with this data set is that we know already that not every protein is expressed at every synapse. Um, so can we actually start to sample from this and get a, get a feel for it? Well, can, can, do we, when we pull down with different baits, do we add and remove clusters? But for instance, if we pull down from a, a, a bait on here, so one of the, an antibody for, for protein in here, do we get everything that's in here and maybe one or two or three of these other ones? Or do we get a few of these things and a few of these things and a few of these things? So it's the first thing we wanted to test. I and mean, we are we actually, does everything just fall apart? What we've artificially done here is stuck everything back together in a way that never exists. But interestingly, what we actually get is that um, very few of the communities, so the baits are nicely spanned, it's spread over the network. So it's nice and easy to do this one. But actually what we get is we get an even distribution of internal and internal edges. When we pull down from one of these, we're just as likely to get things from in here as we are from things across uh, the network. So what you don't get, if you pull down this, is just this and maybe one or two others. What you get is a couple from here and you sample from elsewhere across the network. So there's, there's a lot of uh, diversity in there that's hidden by the proteomics when you've mashed everything back together that we're going to have to, to start looking and dealing with. So the other thing we obviously wanted to look at was um, diseases. Um, you know, is this interesting? So we did that with the small complex. How does it, how does it work with the larger one? So again, 1,300 uh, proteins. And have a look for how many is then linked. This is using uh, GeneRef. We could also use OMIM and various other things. There are limitations to these databases, but that, that, those are, what are available to scale to that kind of size of, of analysis. So what we've got is, for instance, for Alzheimer's, there's 44 associated with that. If that was a random population, it, it, we then test that against a random sample, um, which uh, p to the minus 4 is the likelihood of getting that at random. But of course, as I said right at the start of this little bit, that was so-called interesting proteins. So if you're going to do a proteomics experiment and you had an Alzheimer's target, you'd probably include it. Um, so we tested for that by removing all the baits. Uh, and yeah, so for instance, uh, Huntington's, and it turns out post hoc we discovered actually yeah, the, the, the two Huntington's related proteins were in there because they knew they were related to Huntington's and it was the only ones they, they, they put in. Um, so yeah, we, the, the p-values do go down a little bit but we're still looking at very significant enrichment uh, over random samples. Um, 
Well, these. Um, in terms of the, the structure, though, um, we get one cluster that's significant for Alzheimer's. So in terms of, that, this is for the network, these are the p-values for the network overall, but you can also then map those back onto the, um, to the clusters that we saw, so look at the density of the clusters. Um, so this is just the Alzheimer's disease genes in orange, kind of over the top of the network, and you can look for the enrichments. This is the cluster where it's significantly enriched. You can see where everything's there and then highlight those ones, most of which are either candidate or known uh, drug targets already. Or have been, or at least been proposed as potential drug targets. There's various screens going on for quite a few of these. So, uh, what about the evolutionary or origins? We've done this for the, for the postsynaptic density. What about the presynapse? Um, so we did the same thing. We mapped all the, the mammal uh, genes onto fly and yeast. We didn't do the full 19 species. We just did the kind of core ones that we were interested in. Found all the orthologs, classed each gene as mammal specific, metazoan, or uh, potentially primitive in terms of. It's a potential origin. Just to remind you, this is basically the same analysis there. That's what we did for the postsynaptic density, where we got 45% in Drosophila. This, this slide looks is a bit better now, and 23% in yeast. Uh, but when we do it for the presynapse, um, we get almost all of them map onto human, as we would expect, um, but with an orthologue of fly of 77%. So almost all of them, or the majority, vast majority, we can find a clear orthologue in fly, much higher than we. Uh, expected to find if we would assume that the same pressures were on the presynaptic and postsynaptic regions. Ortholog and yeast was more or less exactly the same, so 30% versus 23% or 24%. Uh, so a jump, so jumps in terms of uh, postsynaptic density from 45 to 77%. Um, and again, we can map those onto the network so we can look and see where are the ancient proteins within this, look for clusters that are enriched either for or against those, those things, so we can see, for instance, a whole pile of them. Um, uh, structural proteins clustering together, um, uh, chaperonins and things like that, that are of very ancient origin. And we can look again at the metazoans where we're getting structural scaffolds or signaling scaffold molecules and uh, ion channels pretty much uh, clustering together there. So that's where, that's where we're, we're kind of getting to with this. Where we're going next is, of course, we, we've We've kind of assumed that this is all one big mush. And of course, it's not. There are various, act, you know, there's, for instance, there's the active zone, there's various other parts of the cellular organization that we've just not taken into consideration at this point. <coughs> um, so what we're actually in the process of doing is defining little groups of these and going and redoing the analysis on those groups. So that's, that's what's coming next sort of thing. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily make an awful lot of sense to put all these things together. But we have the entire map of possibilities now. Um, and so that's, that's what's coming next. So the, just to summarize where we are with that, the IP data supports this kind of diverse population of synaptic complexes. But we still need to divide these data sets up so they make a little bit more sense. That might be an artifact of the fact we've lumped everything together. There's strong enrichment for specific diseases. At the moment, we see one cluster uh, enriched for Alzheimer's. But again, that's, that, that is possibly an artifact of us mushing everything together. As we split it out, we might see uh, enrichment in other clusters when, when that makes a bit more sense. But fundamentally, we are going to need more and better interaction data. And that's just something that's just going to take time to come. We are working with uh, interactomics groups who are actually doing high throughput yeast to hybrid screens uh, on these data, but that's not, that's not available yet. That's going to come in the next year. Um, but uh, I think that's a common story for anybody doing protein-protein interaction network. Just you know, data analysis, just getting the interaction data is, is fundamentally difficult. It's, very r it's expensive to generate. Um, it's noisy. Most of the methods are hard. Um, so we, we have to be careful with these. As I said, this, the, the known one was a list that we got from, from one of the groups who was doing this in terms of their confidence. Where is it? Um, so that 279. Yeah, I mean, we need to look at them in a bit more detail and see what they were, why they're not in there. Would you expect it? Would you have expected to find them? Obviously, you know, the, the, the cho all, the, all 50 baits are from this list as well. Um, and so, um, now we don't know what they are yet. I haven't looked at them yet. Where am I? So that 
those kind of methods allow us to, to take these kind of raw data sets and build these static representation maps. There's, there's data, the way, they're basically a way of doing data integration. So we can get a, a map of all possible interactions, at least all, pos all known interactions. As, the, as I said before, the, uh, a lot of interaction data is missing or it's never been, it's never been analyzed. So we have to assume that the, the networks we're dealing with are, are a sparse representation of what's really there. But they are just a static representation, and the nervous systems, if we, if we know one thing about it, we know it's not static. Um, so there is competition for binding sites, there is more of what some molecules than there are of others, and we're looking for ways to, um, uh, to, 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 to build that kind of level of understanding into the models. And so Oksana Sorokina Sor in the group has been leading a development of a kind of next level where we're going with this, where we can try and look at more logical models that allow us to capture at least some of the dynamics. Now, it's not, and these aren't full dynamic models, at least to capture some of the logical processes and relationships between the types of models that are there. Now, the advantage of these is we can scale these effectively to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 molecules. These, we have to go down uh, a level, an order of magnitude in terms of the, the complexity, just because of the complexity of the model itself. So Xana's approach is to use the, the, the Kappa modeling language. Uh, uh, which she's been working on in collaboration with Vincent Danos's group, um, which allow us to look at the types of rules involved in the interaction between different classes of molecules. And we can abstract that to a class of molecules. We don't have to model every single interaction for every single molecule. We can say, for instance, PDZ type interactions, and we can, we can classify those or model those just at the level of the, of, the, of the general interaction type. And we can define rules for the common ones and where possible, we can go to the literature and get the dynamics for those, or eventually go to the lab and get them. But at the moment, those are estimated where they're known uh, from the literature. Uh, and then start building, building these models up. Those then allow us to actually simulate the, the formation of molecular complexes, because they now actually have the rules in that say, interaction A and B requires a phosphorylation at a specific site, or there's competition with other interactions, or there's, there are uh, various other constraints. So the kind of first level interactions, uh, the so first level of these models is shown there, and that's just basically capturing the types of model, models, uh, types of molecules that we've got into the model and the various interactions between them. So each one of these black lines basically says that there is a rule within the model system that defines how that interaction uh, occurs and what, the, uh, and what we know about it. Uh, and for a lot of these, it's estimated from the literature. What we can do from this is we can, we can actually assemble uh, virtual molecules or virtual complexes from these. Given this, you can put, you make the uh, proteins available and then essentially compete to see what you can build together. So this is just one of the, of the very early simulations that was done with, with a limited number of the molecules available and highlighted as with the PSD95 uh, and one of the other scaffolding molecules just in red and, and blue respectively. Uh, to look at the kind of distribution you get. Now, now we've actually started got PSD95, for instance, now interacting with two or three molecules uh, within the complex instead of the 45 potential interactions that we'd have done if it was in a static network. So it's no, there are no competition for the interactions within each molecule. So you're starting to get what we believe is a little bit more re uh, realistic. What we can also do with this, obviously, is we can then say, right, well, what if we take some of these molecules away uh, what happens to these, these, these simulations. So for instance, we can zoom in on this, then remove PSD95, so essentially virtually knock the thing out um, and see what happens to the complex. First of all, what we notice is that the, com the molecular complex you can support is half the size uh, that it is with PSD95, and that's something that seems to be borne out in, in animal studies as well. The PSD95 knockouts are lethal, but if you can get some neurons through to at uh, the right stage, you can actually get small complexes uh, out of these, uh, these animals. But what we notice is we can then start to make predictions, like even with this very, very simple model, we can start to say shank, for instance, now is, is, has a much stronger role in, in pulling the network together. Now, we wouldn't necessarily rush out and, uh, and, and do a whole pile of experiments based on this. This was one of the very first models. But it shows that we can actually start to make predictions from this. We can up and down regulate the availability of different molecules and look and see what other things can come in to potentially compensate for it. So we're starting to get to that level where it's a little bit more predictive. Rather than just mapping what we know, we can start to get some predictions from this. The sort of complexes that we're getting now look a little bit more like this. And this is color coded depending on the, uh, uh, for instance, we've got the red or the, the, the um, membrane bound or the known membrane bound molecules. 
uh, within the complex. The molecular, com the molecular density of this is approximately right, it's in the right order of magnitude um, for this. And so we can, for instance, as I just said, we can highlight the membrane brown proteins uh, and then look at the distribution. If we linearize this to flatten out all the membrane brown proteins out, we can start to look at, say, for instance, where the kinases in blue are now distributed and various chains that, that project presumably into the, uh, into the cell. Uh, this isn't real spatial distribution, though. This is just us flattening things out and, and putting the, the membrane bound things in. And we know that spatial organization is important. So one of the things we've been looking at recently is how do we actually extend this into actually capturing some of the spatial rules as well as the interaction rules. So, in other words, for instance, a typical example is the AMPA receptor, sig uh, AMPA receptor trafficking, uh, where there are various stores of AMPA receptors around the cell, and the regulation of their, their incorporation into the postsynaptic density is incredibly important in actually regulating its function. But the, the language, is, as it stood, was not capable of actually building that in. So, Xana has been working uh, with Donald Stewart and Vincent Danis uh, to extend the, the modeling language itself to actually start to be able to capture those rules as well, so she can now actually bring in spatial constraints, where effectively you have um, available AMPA receptors in a space uh, which can integrate with a postsynaptic density in PSD95, mole oops, sorry, PSD95 molecules, and that, those relationships can now be captured where uh, you get the AMPA receptor molecules actually uh, slowly incorporated into the PSD95 uh, network. Again, you can then start to model that by do, doing, for instance, starting off with, a, with a, a distributed population of these things and saying, right, look, over a period of time, what's the integration of the AMPA receptors into the PSD uh, complex? And you can see it reaches effectively a more or less a steady state over a period of time. But then we can then say, right, okay, let's remove some of the key molecules. So we know, for instance, PSD95 is critical in incorporating AMPA receptors into the the complex, we can then reduce the availability of PSD95 and you can start to sample how much you would then reduce the availability of AMPA receptors. So this is just reducing it uh, by about two thirds in terms of its availability. And if we almost knock it out, uh, you can then start to see that the AMPA receptors don't get incorporated at all uh, or just at random noise levels. So this is the incorporation right here versus the other molecule types. And then when we remove PSD95 altogether, it's pretty much flat. So what I've tried to do is, is go through what I think is, is, is one route to start off where we start off with these, these big raw data sets uh, coming from uh, high throughput molecular biology studies. Um, we can start to build these static integration models, data integration models that allow us to capture everything we know lump it onto, onto one thing where we can at least look for associations in, in large list-based studies. But then we're actually starting to get into extracting the key molecules from these into these more logical uh, models that actually allow us to make, make predictions in terms of a receptor availability or channel availability within a complex. And that's where we're, we, we see as the, the start of a, of a kind of link uh, up the level of organization into some of the work that you're going to, is going to be presented this week uh, by some of the other uh, speakers, where they're actually looking at how do you, you model compartments or, 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 or some of physiological processes. Because if we can go from these to say, if you change the expression level of a molecule, we can start to make actual predictions on how that would affect key molecules that are involved in the physiology. So it allows us to link to the next level of organization. So, I mean, just to to, to wrap up, I mean, as I tried to say, all levels of analysis that give you something um, in terms of, but, the, but the, the, the more realistic models and the more realistic you get, the more expensive that model gets to actually generate in terms of just getting its data, how to simulate it, how to build it, everything gets, gets more expensive, it gets harder. Um, and those logical models, as I said, give us a means to link from the molecular towards the cellular. It's a long way off yet, but I think we've, we've potentially got a, a way to do it. Kappa modeling is not the only way to do this. There are other approaches. Um, this is just the one that, that we've, been, we've been using uh, locally and we quite like. Finally, I'd like to thank our funders from the Wellcome Trust, MRC, BBSRC, EPSRC and Framework 7 in the EU. And I've gone through a lot of people's data today. 
uh, but Simon Knowles Barley did all the fly gene expression work. Bilal Malik did the fly pull downs. Colin McLean developed some of the clustering software. Oksana uh, covered all, uh, led the Kappa development that showed you in the last third of the talk. Uh, Alyssa Marcos did some of the early fly work as well. And this was all done in collaboration with Seth Grant, uh, Vincent Danos, and Andrew Pocklington and Hugh Smith's group, groups, uh, who provided an awful lot of the, the raw data, especially in the, the, the mammal studies. So, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> So it's yep. known that uh, sometime in the era of bony fishes, uh, genomes got duplicated. Yep. So that in most vertebrates, there are uh, on average four orthologs. Mm -hmm. you know, single, what you might find a single orthologue in yep. flies and yep. worms. And so I'm wondering how much of this, these plots that just show you know, is just that, that's just that you, you, I think you, you I think that to, you know, um, I think that is the basic mechanism that's driven it. Absolutely, um, and if you look at you know, our favourite important molecules again, very, being very subjective, that's that is what you see. For instance, the uh, PSD95 and it's it's four, it's three. Uh, it's a di this large one in fly has four mammalian orthologs, exactly as you see. Interestingly, it looks as though some of the splice variants in the fly. Uh, mapped to different orthologs, but which is, you know, it's, it's, it's neat. The, the story looks as though it's holding up. But yeah, I think that is definitely the mechanism, well, all the evidence we have suggests that's the mechanism that has driven this. Then select, then what has then been selected into brain function has, has, has what's gone since, and then that's what we are seeing. But the mechanism's definitely been from genome evolution. There's very little evidence for real novel things in there. Um, it's pretty limited. Yeah. So the, the data, that, the, the tissue that this comes from, is this whole brain or is this cortex or hippocampus? It depends on the study. Some of them's forebrain, some of it's um, uh, dissected regions. If it's fly, it's whole head, because you can't dissect 10,000 fly brains. So, um, so it, it differences between, say, spinal cord and thalamus. We do, yes, and we do get differences when we do it. I'm not, I've, everything I've tried to present has been as close as possible today, but if we actually look at very different regions like spinal cord and yeah, you, you would get a difference. So those differences might be good ways to test whether your models are really predictive? Yeah. And mm. does that work? We haven't done it yet. But that's a good way to do it. Um, we don't have the quality of data, for instance, for spinal cord or for, or for some of these other regions yet. but. Uh, we are focusing at the moment on working with groups who have got uh, knockouts for those kind of key proteins and are doing proteomics on those knockouts anyway um, as probably the cleanest single way of doing it, but that is another approach that would be worth following up. Okay. So, so you describing what you get with good data, can you, have you got a feel for how much, uh, uh, how much overlap there would be or how much so if you do, if you look at the data you get from the kind of tap tag type approaches where you're genetically engineering tags, you typically get a much smaller number. So it's typically 250, 300 proteins. And these, but these methods are really quite sensitive. I mean, they're quite advanced these days. So I, I think that's, you're getting towards, on an individual synapse class, that's, you're getting towards that, it's a more realistic number. And so when, um, so have you done this, so now you can compare different synapse classes? Kind of we don't have enough tap tag data for that yet. That's coming. Uh, there, are, there are groups with, that we're working with who are generating it, but there's not enough of that available just yet. Um, the other, obviously, the other thing we could do is we could do it at the fly uh, level as well because we've got these 500 ones done, but they've not been. They've been systematically done in embryos, but not in brain nervous tissue specifically yet. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So mm -hmm. following up on these same questions. Yeah. There, there are a number of molecules that are known to be expressed in only one class of neurons. Yeah. Not, not Most of the um, of what you show actually don't fall into that category. Mm -hmm. They're 
last part the very above. Yeah. Um, but if you could focus on the IPs for those banks which do, and then remove them, the prediction is if your clusters actually correspond to complexes that represent particular types of synapses, yeah. then they should drop out in a way that's that's what you were describing didn't happen for most of the tags. That is, you got a very distributed dropout. You should actually lose a whole cluster if that cluster really represents a physical complex at a certain classes of, class of synapses. Yeah. So I wonder if you have we don't have that data yet. Um, that would be good like to get. Some of those, I don't know, you yeah. Can, you can email me the list of sure. 80 targets yeah. on tell you if any of them are yeah. not expressed. Cool. Yeah, no, no. The, yeah, the, there's some interesting things that, you know, there the are protein protein interactions that uh, exist in these models where we know those, no, those molecules never exist in the same cell. Uh, we have got examples of that, uh, and we can pull things like that out of it. Uh, so we know that there are things in there that. Um, don't exist. That's, that's one of the reasons for going through the logical models, all is to capture some of those restrictions a little bit better. Um, and we've even gone back and tested that those proteins never exist in the cell, just to be 100% sure. And we can see them in very, very different cell types in the fly. So, the, yes, the approach is kind of hostage to the experimental data. Yeah, data. absolutely. And, I mean, if you were going to look to sort of an alternative high throughput method to validate the results. Maybe it was the EIA exists, but I, I, I guess what there is though is I mean it's not it's one of these things that's hard to, to, to go through in a talk is that they're they're not the groups we work with aren't the only ones doing doing these experiments. Um, and if you looked at five or six years ago and you looked at two proteomics experiments trying to do roughly the same thing, you'd have two completely different lists. Yeah. So the confidence in any one list would be pretty low. What we are starting to see is the overlap is, is getting a lot more substantial. It's not perfect. There's still, every time you do it, you maybe get 20, 30 percent new things. But it's, it's, down to the, it's down to the minority of things that you're finding is new now rather than. Uh, and, and it's not just that we have the whole genome. So it's, 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 still, a, it's still a fraction of the, the available gene or proteome um, when you compare it to other tissue types. So it's getting better, but you know, we, we are obviously limited by. But is it realistic to expect, you know, EM, you know, sort of co-receptor type stuff, like that, to sort of believe <laughs> the interactions? Not sure. Um, that kind of changes every few months, but yeah, there's, there's, I mean, Intact, for instance, is one of the key ones we use. There's a human protein protein interaction database we use as well. Um, but there's a, a bunch of these that we use. Um, I know one point you were doing the text mining, and that's the thing. I mean, has, has, the, has the field moved on having to do that? Which is you still have to check things. Right. Um, that's for sure. Uh, there, there is, there's noisy data um, out there, and so you, you have to check where, you know, what's, what the sources are. There's a lot better annotation in the databases now of what the sources were. So are they coming from automated prediction algorithms, or are they coming from text, automated text mining, or are they coming from what types of, uh, of, of basic biochemical study? So you can actually filter that out a lot, a lot easier now. Um, it's not as hard as it was when we did some of these first networks where we built them by hand, effectively. Um, but yeah. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Cheers.